Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Yvette Alex Asenso, Vice President for Equity and Inclusion and Professor of Political Science at the University of Oregon. Prior to joining the UO in 2012, she served as a tenured professor of political science and a dean at Indiana University in Bloomington. Alex Asenso is the author and co-author of five books, including Neighborhoods, Family, and Political Behavior in Urban America, Newcomers, Outsiders, and Insiders, Immigrants and American Racial Politics in the Early 21st Century, and Malcolm X and Africa, as well as numerous scholarly essays. She's a consultant on diversity and gender issues, a trained lawyer, and a registered mediator. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. What attracted you to the University of Oregon? What, what, what was it that made you interested in coming here? Well, the opportunity to really make an impact at the particular time that I was recruited. The university was transitioning from an office that focused purely on diversity uh, to one that launched into this notion of equity and inclusion. And I was intrigued by the idea of a university interested in embedding those concepts and practices throughout both the academic and the administrative unit. So it was just an opportunity I couldn't pass up. So say a little bit about your understanding of, of the distinction between diversity and equity and inclusion. Yeah, so diversity is the outcome that we'd like to see. And we want it to be sustainable, not a revolving door of folks coming in and out. And equity and inclusion are sort of the factors that lead to um, diversity. So equity is removing barriers that traditionally prevent people from bringing their full selves to an environment, whether it's the classroom or a research lab or an employment opportunity. Inclusion is the opportunity to actually include people from diverse backgrounds. So whether that's by gender or sexual orientation or religion or race or ethnicity. And if you have equity and inclusion, both the removal of barriers and the opportunity to influence change or participate in decision making, people are likely to stay and to thrive in those environments, which leads to sustainable diversity. I see. Okay, so you've already begun to give us a sense of, of the answer to my next question, but how do you, as the, the Vice President for Equity and Inclusion, how do you, what are the things you do to accomplish those goals? What, what, what does that VP do? What do you do every day? Well, I think the, the most important thing to do is to build relationships because uh, the work of equity and inclusion really is not my work. Mm -hmm. I serve as the advocate for embedding it and um, the lead practitioner, helping people to understand how to marry their expertise in a particular area with the expertise of equity and inclusion. Um, and so it's important to build relationships with people long before there's an interest in going in and doing any tinkering and transformation so that there's rapport and there's trust. Um, and I think uh, that was a lesson that I had to learn coming from a large public institution uh, that was really driven by the presidency and the, the leadership that Oregon is different. Uh, people like to participate in change in a way that uh, really does involve a lot of deliberation. So there's a lot of time that needs to be done. And I now understand why there's so much coffee that's consumed here. <laughs> <laughs> because people drink coffee and talk about these things again and again. Um, so you know, it, it's, it was a good lesson. It was a learning opportunity for me as well. Beyond that then, it's understanding how each context differs and that there's no cookie cutter approach. So what works on the administrative side of the house doesn't necessarily work on the academic side of the house. What works in student life does not necessarily work with, you know, in chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think at the end of the day, people do really want what is best mm -hmm. for the university and it's trying to find a common understanding of what that looks like in the 21st century and going forward. So uh, the division of equity inclusion is um, a multifarious uh, unit. Yes, Tell is. us about the, the, uh, the units that comprise the division of equity and inclusion. Certainly, well the, the first is the servant uh, unit and that is the office of the vice president for equity and inclusion and we see ourselves really as the servants of the university and thought leaders in the sense that we are supposed to understand what the best practices are. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have uh, the Center for Multicultural Academic Excellence um, that focuses on student success and um, it helps to execute the Diversity Excellence Scholars Program. Um, 
and really provides advising for students on campus who feel um, that they need, in addition to take this class, this is the number of hours you need, a holistic mentor. So our advisors ask about how is your eating going, what's the relationship going like, um, especially for our first-gen students whose parents are not necessarily familiar with the institution, how is that transition going. Um, so that's the center. The second is the Center on Diversity and Community, and that was initially a center that focused externally to community. We continue that focus, but we also marry that with a focus on professional development for our faculty and our staff, and increasingly graduate students. Uh, and there's, the, there's the, also the Multicultural Center in uh, the unit, uh, the union, it's called the EMU here. And um, we try to help our students uh, lead um, in a way that reflects multicultural organizing and thinking. So a lot of times when you see activism on campus, those students come from the MCC. And uh, when I came to the university, there was also uh, the Many Nations Longhouse, which was a part of the division and is now led by uh, Assistant Vice President Jason Yonkers. Why is it important for a public university to have a chief diversity officer? Why is that something that we the institutions need? Well, I'm hoping that uh, eventually institutions won't need them, mm -hmm. but I will answer the question nonetheless. Uh, I think that um, diversity officers are strategists. If, they, if they're doing their job well, they are strategists, and they are partners with presidents and vice presidents and deans in helping them to understand where are the opportunity zones of influence. And at the University of Oregon, we found, especially over the last couple of years, that that influence really resides among the faculty. As a faculty member myself, we know faculty members own the curriculum. They design it. They devise it. They implement it. They do the research. And they partner with students in the learning process. And so if you're going to have real change in an institution, you have to begin with the faculty. And so it's strategizing, right, helping leaders, student leaders as well, to understand how to embed those things for the good of the institution. So one of the ways in which this work has been done is that w it's now um, part of every tenure and promotion file that comes from any faculty member on this campus, a new section in the report that did not used to be there. And this is about the faculty member's contributions to equity and inclusion. Yes. So why is that an important thing to do? Why was that a good thing to add to our tenure and promotion files? Well, first of all, it's important to, to mention that that is an example of a partnership yeah. on campus, that that actually came from the union. Mm -hmm. And um, it's important to have because faculty are motivated just like everyone else. And if there is not an incentive um, to do certain things, uh, sometimes those things fall by the wayside. So a faculty member who's interested in promotion, especially as junior faculty come up through the ranks, um, have the eye on promotion and understand in order to get that, I need to be sure about how I'm embedding equity and inclusion into the way that I teach and the way that I serve my profession and my community and my university and the way that I do my research. And if that's rewarded and acknowledged at the tenure and promotion stage, then we think it's going to happen all, all the way through. Now, obviously, there's some additional things that we need to do. We mm -hmm. need to work on annual processing of that, and we need to make sure that faculty feel supported along the way. But I think that's a best practice that we're really proud of at the University of Oregon. So speaking of best practices, uh, one of the things that has happened since you've been the, the VP for Equity and Inclusion is this implementation of what is called the ideal framework. Tell us what the ideal framework is. So ideal, uh, pun intended, is, uh, it stands for five different um, sort of processes that we want to see institutionalized in, 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 in Indiana at University of Oregon. Still 18 years hard to live. Uh, inclusion, uh, this idea of really uh, incorporating diverse viewpoints into decision making. Diversity, the outcome that we want to achieve. Evaluation which is often missing in diversity. People mm -hmm. say, you know, we want diversity, we want people to get along, but we're not measuring. So we want evaluation, that's part of it. Achievement, the idea that people 
should be able to achieve at the highest levels. It's not just enough to get students in the door, but we want them to be in Phi Beta Kappa. We want them to be Fulbright scholars, those things, and then leadership. Um, leadership in place, not just a title or position, but that everyone has the capacity to lead and how are we equipping them to be equitable and inclusive as, they do, as they're doing that leading. And your concept for the ideal framework is that it applies to every aspect of the university. It applies, it's, it serves the students, faculty, administration, the staff, everyone. That's correct. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the students. So we live in a state which is majority uh, Caucasian state. Can you tell us, give us a sense of the demographics of the student body? What are those numbers for our students? Mm -hmm. So our university is, in terms of students, it's still a predominantly white institution. Mm -hmm. About 60% of our students are Caucasian. Um, about 10% of those students are international students, come from all over the world. 2% mm -hmm. uh, African American, uh, around 1% Native American, 12% Latino. 6% um, or so um, Asian American. And there are uh, between three and 5% of two or more races counted in there. And those numbers are better than they have been generally, right? Generally? Uh, yes, so, generally, generally, yes. But they're not reflective of the actual demographics of the state, are they not? Um, so in some instances, they are overrepresented. Okay. And in some instances, they are at par. Uh -huh. um, so for example, African Americans, 2% around, mirror around what we see in the state. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Native Americans, not so much. 1% uh, is, is below what we see in, in the state. Um, Latinos, increasingly, with the 12%, we're gonna see representation in the state of Oregon at that level. Mm -hmm. And Asian American, 6% um, around that, uh, a little higher than, than what we see in the state. So what are some of the strategies that are, does the UO use to encourage students uh, to attend who are from underrepresented groups? Mm -hmm. Well, again, that's where partnership has really played out because we know that under Robert, Roger Thompson's leadership, um, in student services and enrollment management, there's been a lot of effort to reach out to the community. So again, getting back to this notion of relationship building being important in Oregon, uh, families and communities that are underrepresented are not just gonna trust you with their students willy-nilly. You have to build relationships with them before that time. Mm -hmm. And that organization in partnership with, with DEI and with other units across campus um, has really gone out into communities, engaged with schools and community organizations. We've been at the community fairs and the, and the sort of big tent opportunities, shaking hands, mm -hmm. building relationships with parents and civic or, and community organizations. And so there is increasingly a level of comfort with community members understanding that the University of Oregon is not just a university that wants to recruit and have these high numbers of students coming, but we actually graduate. If you look at our numbers across the state, the University of Oregon is the most successful in graduating uh, underrepresented students, whether those are counted socioeconomically or according to race and ethnicity. Um, and it's because of those partnerships. Mm, uh, and, and, and the outreach, I think, is the key. The relationship building is, is the key. I would say the second thing that we've done very well uh, in partnership with Mike Andreasen's group uh, in terms of advancement is to raise money. Mm -hmm. Because when, you, when you're dealing with underrepresented families, first generation college students, there's often the issue of economics and, and how they're gonna afford to send their students to school. So those two things, building trust and having resources are important. I think the third thing that we're trying to do more work on right now in partnership with uh, the new Vice Provost, Danica Scott, is to make sure that student success is an embedded part of all of the student experiences, not just engaging, mm -hmm. but really being successful from the time they get in to the time they get out. I know one of the areas that Danica is uh, going to be overseeing is the new um, Tyson Center. And th th my understanding is that one of the jobs of that center is to be more fully involved with undergraduates at every stage of their education so that they don't slip through the cracks or that they're getting advising 
continuously so that this is a key, I think, generally for retention and also for timely to, to completion to degree, which I know are both priorities of the president. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this um, pipeline building programs too? You've talked about the relationship building, but what about those programs? Sure, so um, when I came to the university, I was very fortunate to be the beneficiary, especially in uh, the Division of Equity Inclusion of a of a per particular program, the Oregon Young Scholars Program, that was designed by Carla Gary. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been able to not only keep that program running, but enhance it by including some robotics and physics and, and partnering with the SAIL program. Uh, that's another program that uh, DEI helped to enhance, not only by providing funds for the director at the time, but also helping to raise money for it. So now it has its own uh, funding source. Um, those two programs are important because they give students who never have never thought about themselves as college students an opportunity to come on campus to experience um, lectures and engagements with professors, have real assignments to complete, stay in the dorms, mm -hmm. and get a, you know an early lesson on what it means to apply for funding for scholarships and all of those things. Um, and we see actually students from those programs applying to the to the University of Oregon, both SAIL and um, uh, and OISP, um, thanks to the goodness of of the president's funding, we also will, will be able to expand those programs. Uh, we've actually been able to partner with others in California to bring new students on, um, and so it's been an excellent opportunity for faculty to engage with students in the summer and for students and their parents actually to learn more about the University of Oregon uh, as a destination spot for their students. So February is Black History Month. Um, how will and how has the university uh, celebrated black history? How are some of the th what are some of the things that are happening on this campus this month? Yeah, yeah. so um, lots of, of lectures and series uh, going on. Cheryl Harris, uh, a lawyer um, who's worked with the president in the past, is coming to, to give the, the talk for February. Um, we also are, are just trusting our students and partnering with them more. So they're helping us to design programs and their awards, banquets, and um, uh, skits and, and things of that sort uh, that, they are, that they're engaged in. So we're really looking forward to that. We also partner a lot with the community. So Blacks in Government, the NAACP mm -hmm. um, are two organizations that we work really well with. And last week we, we partnered with BIG uh, in terms of attending, but they actually do all of the heavy lifting, Linda Hamilton and, and her group. And two weeks from now, the NAACP. So it's a great time to remember the important role that African Americans have played in the founding of the country um, and the many things that are important for us as Americans, sort of tracing that lineage back to African American communities. So you've mentioned the uh, activism of our African American students on campus. Um, their activism has had a significant impact in the past few years at the University of Oregon. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So um, in keeping with what was going on and around the country in uh, late 2015, uh, sort of launched it in Missouri, but also with the Black Lives Matter movement, our own students decided that they wanted to engage um, in a solidarity march and then had a list of demands. Um, and 13 or 14 of those demands. Uh, and I think what was really interesting about that particular group of students was that they were very pragmatic uh, because many in the student body uh, wanted, you know, symbolic protests, you know, almost every week and they wanted them to walk out and, and do certain things, but this particular group of students um, really focused on the bottom line of getting a variety of things achieved and accomplished. And we also had the good fortune of a president who understood the importance of partnering with uh, students and um, you know a group of staff who surrounded those two working together to provide leadership and working groups that then buried down and looked at those demands and came up with workable solutions. The students work awfully hard in bringing those things to fruition. And there are a few things that we still are, have yet to accomplish, but many things on the list have been accomplished and they've helped to make the university a better place for all students. And I think that's what we're really proud about. Mm. 
So tell us about some of the ways that the UVO supports undocumented students. So uh, back, um, I think probably two years uh, before we actually started with the formal program, the Center for Multicultural Academic Excellence um, supported a working group um, on undocumented students in, and um, the, the university. And it was through that working group then that um, there were efforts to understand what was going on at other institutions. And that led us to understand that we actually needed to have training, we needed to have a resource center, we needed to have scholarship support. All of those things then came to, to fruition as a result of that initial working group and the training that they've done. We also um, supported a faculty member through uh, the, the Kodak uh, Faculty and Residence Program who devised the training that's now being used and embedded throughout the institution. There's much more work to be done, especially on the fundraising uh, front. Um, but I think that we've, we've been successful in understanding what needs to be done, identifying students, providing them with support, uh, partnering with our uh, government officials um, as well and making sure that they understand what the issues are. And now let's just hope that we can turn the situation around in Washington and get some real action on that front. Uh, amen to that. <laughs> um, do you have a sense of how the campus climate has changed since the Division of Equity and Inclusion was established? Do you have a sense of the, are there metrics that you use to judge that, to answer that kind of question? Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you mentioned metrics because evaluation is a really important part of our um, framework. And one of the things that we're launching is the climate survey. Mm -hmm. um, and that will allow us to have a benchmark of understanding. But what we do know is that um, because of the LACE framework, which is a married on to ideal, um, ideal is, is the what. Mm -hmm. We need to accomplish inclusion, diversity, evaluation, achievement, leadership. LACE is the how. Mm -hmm. Love, authenticity, courage, and empathy. When I came to the university almost six years ago, and by no means am I saying that I did this, uh, but what I am saying is that um, the focus was more on the what and not as much on the how. Mm -hmm. And together, working with many folks across campus, we've come to understand that the how is just as important as the what. And so when we talk about love and authenticity and courage and empathy, it opens up room and space for people to understand that emotions and relationships and how you treat folks, um, all of those things are just as important as changing sort of the, the demographics of the institution. So we find people actually saying l love as part of the goals of our work and authenticity being really important in the work. And, and I think that has helped us to understand, um, understand the importance of taking care of one another. And that is key and essential to the outcomes that we want to see in the end. Is there, are there one or two accomplishments that DEI has achieved since you've been here that you're most proud of? Mm. I think, um, I think when people say that the climate, the way people engage on campus around these issues has changed um, as a result of our work, that's important. As a social scientist, it's a little difficult for me because I actually want to see the numbers and, <laughs> <laughs> and the charts, so that's one thing. Um, I, I also uh, very much appreciate the way in which diversity is diverse on this campus mm -hmm. and that people talk about the different ways to include different segments of people. Mm -hmm. And that's really important, that, that O mm -hmm. that represents the University of Oregon is inclusive and ever-expanding. Yes, it seems to me, I think, or at least speaking for myself, my understanding of what diversity means has become more capacious than it once was. It includes a, a much broader sense of what diversity can be. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about the efforts uh, to diversify the faculty. I know that this is a complicated problem. Uh, what are some of the things that the university does to try to accomplish that goal? Mm -hmm. Well, the first is to bring awareness of this issue by sharing data about what our applicant pools have looked like 
and helping faculty to understand that they really do own that process and that we are not trying to wrestle that process away from them. Mm -hmm. And as owners, they also have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. So providing professional development about what the best practices are at our peer institutions and our aspirant institutions, Harvard and Yale and the UC Berkeley's of the world. We want to be like them. This is what they're doing in this area and this is how we can get the best and the brightest. And there's been some uh, resistance, but more importantly, there's been lots of attention and, and lots of welcoming of those ideas. And I think if we really want to see transformation across the institution, we have to start with a more diverse faculty, mm -hmm. not only in terms of race and ethnicity, and that I think is key and important in terms of looking at the dearth of, of those kinds of faculty of the institution, but ideological diversity, disciplinary diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and that begins, interestingly enough, with something as small as the job description. Mm -hmm. Because the way you define the job and the kind of language that you use well, lets folks know who are looking for opportunities whether or not they have a chance. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't know, I don't know the answer to this question, so I'll ask it one way, and depending on what you say, I'll ask it another way. Um, do you get the opportunity to teach? Do you have time to teach? Yes, I'm uh, in fact teaching a class right now in the law school. Can you tell us about that class? Yes, yeah, so uh, the class was originally taught by Eric Gervon, mm -hmm. uh, and Eric and I partner on the implicit bias training. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the class basically helps students to understand the interface or the intersection between law and bias. And, you know, there's this whole uh, thought process that the law is really objective and, you know, the law is the law. And so we unpacked that, that notion of objectivity in the law. We're not saying the law is bad. We mm -hmm. love the law. Mm -hmm. But of all that getting, of all that getting, get understanding. And I think it's important for our students as social engineers and as change agents to understand their role and the role that bias plays in the law. So it's a great class on race and gender and we invite speakers from all over the state to come and it's a good time. Well, thank you for telling us about that class. Thank you for telling us about the Div Division of Equity and Inclusion. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. Likewise. I've been speaking with Yvette Alex Asenso, Vice President for Equity and Inclusion and Professor of Political Science at the University of Oregon. Thanks so much for watching.